thank you so much for having me. I really want to thank the conference committee for inviting me and uh, particularly David for kind of shepherding me through this process. Um, I've been learning a lot about SMART recovery in the past couple of years. I've actually always known about SMART, but um, I just think you're doing really important work and I'm really honored to be here to have this sort of access to folks who are facilitating SMART meetings. So you could just go to the, um, the overview slide. So this is what I'm going to be covering today. Um, I'm going to do some background rationale around talking about common factors of behavior change therapy and psychotherapy as a way to kind of think about how people change addictive behaviors. And then I'm going to talk about my own work on this topic and specifically three uh, key processes of behavior change therapies. I'm going to talk about really just some sort of like handy tips on how to engage in these three processes. And this is, the project actually has five total, but it's a work in progress. So psychoeducation, setting goals and monitoring goals, and uh, providing behavioral coping skills training <clears throat> is what I'm going to be talking about today. So just a little bit of rationale. You can advance the slide. You can advance it again. So why common factors? Um, I'm going to actually just step back and define common factors. So common factors can be defined as processes of therapies or of people's behavior change that are relevant and predictive of outcome, regardless of the actual treatment that you have to happen to be receiving, right? So these are processes that cut across different modalities of treatment. And why are they important or interesting? Well, the history of psychotherapy research is that it was based on a medical model. And it was based on this idea that you could discover a single treatment that would be, you know, superiorly effective for a single disorder. But what happened is that totally never worked, okay? And so the evidence really actually shows that we have a lot of effective evidence-based treatments and that they work similarly and moderately well. So that brings me to this quote, which is that the dodo bird said that everyone has won and all must has, have prizes. And this has been used as a metaphor. This, this quote actually as a metaphor for psychotherapy equivalents dates back to like the early 20s. So 1920s, that is. So um, this is a topic that's been around for a while. But it's a metaphor for this idea that if you place two well-developed treatments in a head-to-head -head contrast mm -hmm. clinical trial, these treatments will perform moderately and similarly well. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of that. So in this slide, you can see a comparison of cognitive behavioral therapy, 12-step facilitation, which is a professionalized version of AA, and motivational enhancement therapy, which is a four-session version of motivational interviewing. And you can see, if you look along the y-axis on both of the figures, you see um, percent days of abstinence, and you also see uh, days to first heavy drink. And then if you look along the x-axis, that's length of follow-up. And so what's my whole point here? Well, my point is that these lines are on top of each other. So now I'm going to show you um, another figure which this is from Project Combined. So this is in the context of both pharmacological and behavioral treatments. So this is a comparison of a combined cognitive behavioral and motivational intervention, and it's with or without naltrexone. And so if you look, if I, want, I want you to actually look at the second figure. And this is the arm of the study that was the CBI with and without naltrexone. So CBI plus placebo, CBI plus naltrexone. And again, the lines are right on top of each other. Okay, so these treatments, these different treatments are performing similarly well. If you look at the no CBI arm, so this is actually just a direct contrast of naltrexone and placebo, you can actually see that the placebo, if I had a pointer, I'd be totally pointing, but <laughs> I know, so you just envision a, a little red light floating around. Um, you can see that the placebo group actually does do a bit worse, but it is interesting, it doesn't do that much worse. So this has been referred to as the dodo bird verdict. 
right? This is not unique to addictions. This is actually true in psychotherapy. This is true in mental health. Um, I'm not saying that all treatments are absolutely equal, but I'm saying that on average, when you compare two evidence-based treatments to each other, they do perform similarly well. As I said, the, the, the difference between them would be zero in outcome. But this calls into question how treatments work, right? Because these different treatments have different underlying, different explanations for how change occurs. And so if they both work, then who's actually right? Who's, who's winning the theoretical horse race? So, for example, if both SMART and AA are working equally well, then how can we think about how people are changing in the context of these two treatments? Well, we can think about it in a few ways, but two ways are that we can think about the treatments being similar. So we think that there actually is the possibility that AA and SMART are more similar underneath the sort of surface of their terminology than they are different. We can also think about people's change processes being similar. So this explanation is more like, you know, regardless of what SMART or AA tell you to do, the people in these, in these groups are actually changing in similar ways, right? So they're having similar processes that are being activated by these two different um, modalities. So change, change common factors can be in people and they can be in treatments. So this is just a little bit of background on different models of common factors in the psychotherapy literature and in the um, addictions literature. And it's a sampler, it's certainly not exhaustive. So this slide is Carl Rogers' Necessary and Sufficient Conditions for Therapeutic Personality Change. This model speaks primarily to similarities within the treatment and similarities within the, uh, the treatment relationship. And so what we can see first is the provider has congruence with the client. And so what that means is that the provider is authentic and genuine when in a healing relationship with this person. The provider also shows unconditional positive regard for the client. And what that means is that there is acceptance of the person, and that is regardless of whether there might be some disagreement around specific behaviors, specific choices. And the third is that the provider demonstrates accurate empathy to the client. And so this is not only the, the effort to understand a person's worldview, but it's really an effort to communicate that understanding to the person in a way that is at least minimally received. <laughs> and, that was, and that's a kind of terminology from the model. But point being, the person does have to sort of accept and experience that empathy. So this is Frank and Frank's model. And Frank and Frank's model includes, again, the relationship, but it's really an intersection of the therapeutic relationship with positive outcome expectancies, or what we can call installation of hope, and what we can call placebo effects. So the relationship is understood as an emotionally charged and confiding one. There is also, though, a myth or a conceptual model that explains the origins of the client's distress. Connected to that myth is also a, rash, a ritual, right? And so the ritual is mutual therapeutic work that both the provider and the client really buy into. And so in this picture, we see Freud's couch, right? And so if I were to walk into that office and I saw that beard and that pipe and I saw that couch, I might think that this guy knows something that I don't know. It might promote expectancies in me that might influence my own capacity to change. So it may be those expectancies that are really responsible for my therapeutic benefit. Here we see, um, this is also about similarities within the treatment, but also similarities within the treatment, as well as the person and the group process. So this is Yalom's. 11 processes of group therapy that are thought to be curative. And we can see a lot of things going on, um, and I'm not going to cover each one of them, but I'm going to touch on a few of them just to illustrate um, some points. We see universality, right? So universality is the curative effect of having a shared experience with others. We see, again, that installation of hope, so this kind of repetition of that expectancy effect. 
We also see the simple giving and receiving of information. We see a lot of interpersonal learning factors like group cohesiveness, socialization, interpersonal learning. So this model is really kind of showing us a combination of treatment factors that are common and group process and person level factors. This next model is, shows us about similarities in the treatment as well as one similarity that I would see in the person, so a cross-cutting process within the person. And so at this point, you should actually start seeing repetition, right, that there are uh, particular constructs that seem to come up again and again. So again, we see the therapeutic relationship, except that the re it's basically just um, identified here as an empathic counseling style. We also, again, see the provision of information. It's just described here as um, feedback on the presenting condition, as well as advice to change combined with a menu of options for change. And we also see a change process that should happen within the person, which is self-efficacy, that specific belief in one's capacity to change a behavior. So this model was originally designed to uh, identify commonalities across brief interventions for substance use disorders. Um, so that's just kind of some context of where these particular constructs came from. This model is pretty short and sweet. And this is um, called Ready, Willing, and Able. This comes from Miller and Rolnick's um, motivational interviewing book. And so this is really entirely about processes that occur within the person that relate particularly to change initiation, right? So a person needs to recognize that there's a problem. But even if they recognize that there's a problem, they also have to be willing to address that problem. And even if they're both ready and willing, they also have to have the ability, the confidence, the recovery capital, those resources to be able to take specific action toward addressing the problem. So this final model, um, and there's a lot going on in this slide, um, this, this also speaks to similarities in people's change processes, so common factors of people's change. Um, this is from the trans-theoretical model. This is called the processes of change model. And if you look at the table, you can see essentially like the, the process, a definition, and then maybe a measurement item. But what I provided right here is really just more kind of intuitive terms than I think that they use because they use like pretty fancy terms for stuff that we kind of all know about. Um, so I'm going to use those. So there is the seeking of information, right? So again, we have that information seeking. There's a feeling of feelings, right? We saw that in Yalom's slide, except that it was called catharsis. There's a process of assessment, both of the self and of, you know, uh, self-assessment around the effects of the behavior on the self and on people in the environment, the community, et cetera. There is a noticing of changing norms. And so now this is called, in the model, is called social liberation. And it's um, actually, like, this model comes out of the smoking literature. And so this is really about having changing attitudes around how society kind of perceives the behavior. And so I can apply this to myself and my smoking. Right. So when I quit smoking, I quit when they started changing the laws around smoking areas because I felt ashamed sitting out in a particular smoking area. Maybe it was like, you know, freezing in the winter or something like that. And so that really had a major effect on me and my choice to change my smoking behavior. There's an explicit commitment, and that really is, you know, explicit meaning verbalized and ideally written. And then next are a series of coping skills that are often associated with behavioral interventions, right? These, these um, numbers seven through nine actually should look pretty familiar in terms of smart facilitation. Um, but we can really think about these as general processes of change. Uh, so there's, co there's coping around um, substitution. So changing one behavior for another. Maybe it is a problematic behavior for a less problematic behavior. That's harm reduction. We heard about that this morning. It could be a, a problematic behavior for um, a totally pro-social behavior. So I'm going to quit smoking and I'm going to take up exercise. 
Um, there's also coping skills around risk avoidance. So that probably, again, sounds pretty familiar, right? This is avoiding those high-risk situations. This is changing, you know, ideally changing social networks, things like that. Um, and then there's also instituting sort of reward and punishment contingency. So an example of that might be like, uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to go to a smart meeting tonight, and then we're all going to go out for ice cream afterwards. And that ice cream is the reward for engaging in that that you know positive step in terms of going to a meeting. And related to that is the importance of helping relationships, so using the support of others in the change process. So where, where do I fit into all of this? Um, well, I'm talking primarily about similarities in the treatment. I do talk about core processes of change, um, but I, I talk about them in terms of how treatment can affect those core processes of change. And I refer to it as moving beyond semantic differences to underlying core similarities in evidence-based treatments. So the idea is that some of these commonalities might be found if you just kind of look past the terminology and really focus on the procedure. So when I get into talking about this model, you're going to see repetition of constructs that I've already talked about, right? And so you might ask, well, Molly, how is this different? Are you totally re reinventing the wheel? Um, and I would say that it's different in the sense that I'm really looking to just not just name these processes, but actually operationalize them and operationalize them in a way that makes them measurable, observable, and trainable. And in that regard, my history in uh, doing research on motivational interviewing has been very influential because the guiding principle for me in this particular project has been like, how can we take core processes of therapies besides those that are addressed by MI? Because MI does address core common factors of therapy in terms of uh, the relationship, in terms of exploration, in terms of the enhancement of motivation. Um, how can we take other factors besides those and um, make them as easy to train and to observe, to sort of monitor for uh, fidelity or quality control? Um, and disseminate as motivational interviewing. So that's really like my, my inspiration. So these are five things that most treatments and treatment providers already do, right? But the question is, how do you do them really, really well, regardless of the treatment that you happen to be delivering? And so this is a work in progress, as I said earlier. Um, I'm going to discuss two, three, and four today, but I would certainly say that all five are very much um, relevant to SMART facilitation, and so I hope that you kind of stay tuned to this work as it moves along. So they are developing a working relationship, providing psychoeducation, so another way of saying that is just providing information to people. There's goal setting and goal monitoring. There's providing skills training. We can call that behavioral skills training, coping skills training. This is the kind of ex applied experiential component of behavior change. And then there's incorporating environmental and social support systems. So taking advantage of those natural strengths in the person, but also within their environment or even the helping system. So now I'm going to talk about uh, methodology pretty quickly. I just want you to know that I didn't just like sit around and make this up because I didn't. I um, took a pretty systematic approach. So this was a qualitative content analysis of close to 100 sources on therapy and behavior change. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means. Um, this model was developed via review of existing sources and really looking beyond the content and looking at the procedural commonalities, looking at the process. And so there were a set of core sources that cut across all of the, um, the, the, the five core processes. And those core sources were all specific to addiction. And you can see like some of the pictures here of those sources. So they were 10 treatment manuals. 11 therapy demonstration videos, and four government-issued practice guidelines. There was also a separate search process for each of the five core processes. And that search process was very much transdiagnostic and multidisciplinary. Like, I kind of reached far and wide. I looked into business. I looked into philosophy, uh, social psychology, medicine, so a variety of sources. Um, and, you know, each one was kind of more or less relevant depending on which process I was working on. 
So far, there have been 94 sources that I've reviewed, and I've got two uh, collaborators, Dr. Steve Martino and Dr. Bruce Wampold. I would call them, I think, primarily like guides and mentors, and they've been really very supportive and helpful to me along this kind of journey. <laughs> In terms of qualitative methodology, this was a pretty standard framework guided qualitative content analysis. And so what that means is that I coded, I coded all of the sources. These are, you know, therapy manuals, books, these are videos. So sometimes I'm making observations rather than reading text. Um, and I coded examples of principles and examples of practices. And I'm gonna define each of those in a moment. Um, but the process involved just reading sources, reading them again, extracting you know, examples of a principle, examples of a, of a um, practice, and doing that over and over again, and then ultimately kind of organizing and collapsing codes into different themes and categories. So I think an example is we can look at the figure here. Oh. Sorry, that's okay. Um, we can look at the figure here and see um, this is an example of practices related, some of the data on um, practices related to skills training. And you can see that color kind of codes the different themes. So the different themes are skills or practices related to teaching, practices related to uh, engaging in practice, so the applied component practices related to goal setting and practices related to self-efficacy. You can also see that box size kind of shows um, how common a particular practice might be in the source data. So the bigger the box, the more often it kind of came up in the sources. This was a single rater process. That means that I collected the data and that certainly has limitations. I did um, engage a research assistant to do a reliability assessment and we can, you know, have like a lively conversation about that those methods in the discussion, but the bottom line is that the reliability is pretty good. So that means that it's likely that other people can measure these principles and practices. I use it just a standard uh, qualitative content analysis or qualitative software. So what about principles and practices? Well, a principle is a general understanding or a way of being on the part of the provider that is kept in mind when implementing a specific therapeutic practice. So if you know how motivational interviewing assesses um, adherence and competence and things like that, um, a principle is analogous to what they call a global measure. And so this is a sort of a, a single item, you know, typically like, you know, on a kind of five point scale. Um, but it's, it's really the idea is to measure things that are in your heart and things that are in your head, right? These are things you keep in mind when you're delivering a particular intervention. A practice, on the other hand, is a concrete action step or a technique used by the provider when delivering specific therapeutic content. So if we were to compare this to the MI model of adherence and competence, this is analogous to what's called a behavioral skill count. And the difference then is that this is in your words or in your behaviors, right? So practices are in your mind and heart and, uh, sorry, principles are in your mind and heart and practices are in your words and your behaviors. The model happens to be content agnostic. And so what that means is you essentially can apply these principles and practices to any therapy. So now I'm gonna go into the results. Okay, so as I move along, I do want you to kind of think about how this applies to your work in smart recovery. So that's why I put up the four points here, because I want you to kind of reflect on, you know, your work with clients and also your work with smart recovery participants in sort of facilitating uh, the four points of the program. So the first process I'm going to talk about is providing psychoeducation. And like I said, this is just delivering information. Right? So it's defined here as a brief process of therapy focused on the communication of varied aspects of disease and or treatment related information. Okay, so I just want you to reflect a little bit for your own experience, right? Have you been to a doctor, been a psychotherapy client? How was information provided to you? Was it engaging? Was it empowering? Did you have like an interactive sort of back and forth with the person that was teaching you? Did the person ask you actually what you already knew about a particular health-related topic before launching into some kind of ex extensive lecture or handing you a pamphlet? These are the kinds of things that should be happening in high-quality psychoeducation. 
right? The idea is that information can't be boring, right? It, we need to be able to engage with the information and we need to be empowered by the information. And it's that engagement and that empowerment that really allows us to use information. If we're not engaged or empowered, we actually just check out and then we don't learn anything. So what I'm going to do is just go down some of the principles here. It's actually not the complete list. You can look at the paper for more. Um, and then in the next few slides, I'm going to have slides that are specific to, to practices. And there's three, three sets of practices related to delivering psychoeducation. But in terms of uh, principles, psychoeducation is empowering. Just like I said, it's not a top-down expert-recipient interaction. It is a, it is a, a co-created conversation where one person shares information with another and they talk about it. It is informed. So you do definitely have to know what you're talking about because you have to have the capacity to deliver the, deliver the information in a really kind of fluid and interactive manner. It is brief. So people uh, learn best in short doses. And it's interactive, like I said. There are statements, there are questions, there are answers. It is ideally tailored to learning, to personal learning style. So people do learn in different ways. So, so hopefully we know our audience and we have put some forethought into that and been able to kind of match our teaching style to whatever their learning needs happen to be. And it ends with a goal, right? It often ends with a goal, I will say. And so when we typically, when we provide health-related information to people, it's because we want them to use it in some way. And so, you know, a psychoeducational conversation can often translate into a goal-setting conversation. And so everything I said might seem like super obvious, right? But you have to kind of reflect on whether they really are happening in practice. You know, are they all happening? Are they happening consistently? Are they happening in your practice? So these are psychoeducational teaching practices, right? So I said there were different types of practices. The first and probably the, the, you know, the most obvious is teaching practices. So this is the interactive portion of the session. So I'm, I'm going to hope that you kind of work with me. Um, if you were going to tell a smart facilitator how to deliver information to a smart participant, um, what would you tell them? Like, you know, if you want to say, well, like, all right, when you're explaining the four points, like, you really just want to make sure you do this, do this, and do this. Um, and so I just want you to yell them out, and I'm going to repeat them so that it's, you know, heard on the live stream. And so, yeah, what would you tell them? Connect with the participant. Connect with the participant. So making sure that you have sort of an engaged conversation. Absolutely. Great. What else? Right. Excellent. So kind of avoiding that writing reflex, avoiding that sort of urge to kind of swoop in and be like, oh, I can tell you about this and I can tell you about that. Um, yeah, definitely. What are other examples of how we would deliver, how we would tell someone to deliver information? Very kind of nuts and bolts types of stuff. An example. Excellent. So um, apply the um, apply the piece of information to the person's experience or to maybe another person's experience in the group. Yeah. What about any others? Less acronyms. Less acronyms. That's that's really good. Yeah. So uh, less acronyms and um, definitely defining acronyms. Right. Which is I think really hard for all of us. I I may have violated that rule today, but I do try not to because I know it's really important. All right, so I'm going to um, do the reveal now. And so, again, very simple tips. Use plain language. This is related to avoiding acronyms, right? You want to avoid dense jargon. You want to just use simple, everyday terms. You want to use the client's language. This is, the, this is related to, you know, um, providing an example, right? So you're going to use their, their words, their phrases, their stories to sort of integrate the information. You want to go at a moderate pace. You don't want to rush through it. So that does mean that you have to kind of plan ahead to know that you have enough time to cover whatever piece of information you tend to be covering. You want to use do small, meaningful units, right? And so medicine, they have a phrase called chunk, check, chunk, 
a lot of this stuff I got from medicine because they really have put a lot of work in like helping doctors actually like engage patients in medical information. And they've, they've got to have a lot of handy tips. Um, so chunk, check, chunk is you provide a chunk, a meaningful chunk of information. You check in on the person's understanding of that information. And then you provide another meaningful chunk. And related to that is scaffolding the information, right? So you're building up upon prior information, right? And so, you know, ideally the, the uh, second chunk builds upon the first chunk. Okay, so those were all related to just teaching. So these are related to interacting. And some of them actually have came up um, in, in terms of getting other group members to kind of impart the uh, information as opposed to us. But if you were going to, you know, exp again, explain to a smart facilitator, um, this is how you really facilitate an interaction in the group around uh, engagement with the particular information. This is what you got to do. So uh, what might you tell them? So one, I mean, one of the examples was, as it was Brett, right, who said, you know, you would, um, rather than you say it, try and actually get someone else to say it. There might be particular types of questions you would ask. Okay, I'll just do the reveal. <laughs> okay, so they're actually all just types of questions, right? It's just like simple types of questions. So ask what they already know, okay? In motivational interviewing, they have a term called elicit, provide, elicit. It's also referred to as ask, ask provide, ask, okay? It means the exact same thing. It means that you ask a person what they already know about a given topic. Uh, say, blood, you know, if you're talking about blood alcohol concentration, which maybe you wouldn't be, but, um, you know, that's just an example. You ask them what they know about the topic. You provide them with further information on that topic that's going to elaborate on what they said. Maybe you have to gently correct if there's some misinformation there. And then you're going to ask them sort of how that information sits with them. You know, how does it, um, you know, what do you think about that? Does this fit with your experience? And so on. Ask the client to ask questions. So what questions do you have? Right? And it is very specifically an open-ended question, right? It's not, do you have questions? It's, what are your questions? Because what are your questions is actually just creating an atmosphere where questions are to be expected. That when you're providing information to people, that they should have questions. If you see, you know, sometimes in a doctor's office, you'll see, ask me three, right? This is it's just like this idea of like creating an atmosphere. This is like, okay, I, you know, I'm hoping that actually as a, as a patient, you're going to have at least three questions for me about um, this particular prescription or this uh, recommendation I'm making. You're going to ask questions to check for understanding. And so again, in medicine, they have a term called a teach back, right? And so an example of a teach back question is, if you were going to explain the nature of an urge to like a family member, what would you say to them? Like, how would you explain it? Right. And so it allows them to apply the, you know, whatever the piece of information is to their own experience um, and also to put it in their own words. As I said before, you're going to ask questions to explore the reaction. So what do you think about this? Does it fit? Anything to add? So forth. Or what would you like to add? Right. Open ended question. Um, and then you want to explore, potentially you'll, you'll ask questions to explore possible action given that information, right? So, you know, after what we've talked about in terms of this particular tool, like, what do you think, you know, what, what's next for you? What do you think in terms of this week? You think you might see some application happening and, you know, get a conversation around that. Okay, so the, actually, I just did the reveal. But, oh, no, I didn't because I forgot that I'm not running the slide. Okay, so it's blank. It's secret. Um, yeah, totally. Oh, is it this? Okay. Okay, so um, this one's a little tricky, so we'll see if it works. Um, this is about providing tips to smart facilitators around facilitating information retention, right? We want people to remember stuff, okay? Without being like too boring or overburdensome because lots of times the techniques you need to use to get people to remember stuff can be boring and burdensome. So, you know, what might be a couple of things that you might tell them to do? So this, write it down. That's totally awesome, yes. 
Other ones? Other examples? So how are they going to remember it? Restated in their warrant. Okay, so it's, I'm actually going to probably have to <laughs> add to my model because I'm getting new ideas. But yeah, that's great. Oh, that's cool. That's very good because then you're you're incorporating the social relationship and the you know bringing family or partners into the fold. Yeah, that's great. That's definitely one of them, right? So the idea of using a particular tool, so using it's referred to. You can you can go ahead and show it because um, there's just a couple here. Uh, is to help people remember or to hurt their remembering? Yeah. Yeah, it really helps to have like really good acronyms, you know, and that's just like a total art. So I think that I am like a proponent of acronyms, definitely not overusing them. Um, but but you're in the overuse category. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Hello. Is that better? Am I on? Oh, I am totally on. Okay. Yeah. I think that might be better. Um, okay. So these are just a couple. There's definitely more in this paper. Um, use repetition, right? So small pieces of information definitely helps with retention. It also helps to stop to not have people get bored. Um, I've, at this point, I've probably already violated that, but we know the context, and so what I'm doing is appropriate. Um, but you're also going to repeat, 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 right? And so there's an art to that, certainly, and we can get into that in the discussion. Um, but that repetition does does help. Use narrative methods. And so this did come up as, an, as one of the examples that people said. Um, and which is imply, applying the information to the client's story um, or to the story of another person in the group, right? Or even asking, asking the group to apply the information to their story. Um, and then, as you said, use materials, right? Visual materials, written materials, uh, worksheets, et cetera. Acronyms, yes, definitely. Nice colors, uh, big words. You know, I mean, I could actually have a whole separate, like, slide just on how to present visual materials because that definitely matters as well. Okay, I'm actually now, well, we're okay on time because uh, I got plenty of time. Okay, so moving on to the next topic, right? So this is the next core process, goal setting and goal monitoring. This is defined as a collaborative process where providers and clients identify and formulate therapeutic goals actionable objectives, and revisit, measure, and renegotiate these plans via a standardized procedure over time. Okay, so that sounds probably pretty bossy. <laughs> I'm sorry, I do have that problem in my personality. Um, but I think there is a role for standardization around goal setting, and particularly goal monitoring. It has to do with accountability to our outcomes. I do also recognize that smart recovery meetings have rolling admissions, so you have people coming in and out every week. Um, and that can definitely present a challenge in terms of setting goals and particularly monitoring goals over time. Um, so I hope that we can actually get into that into the discussion in the discussion because I think you definitely do have some people who come back week after week. So what are the principles? Goal setting necessitates goal monitoring, right? So don't forget to monitor. <laughs> um, goal, se goal setting and monitoring involve a working relationship. And actually, the data shows that it not only, like, does the, the working relationship is the foundation on which goal setting really optimally occurs, but it actually facilitates a working relationship. So there is data around that. Goal setting and goal monitoring inter are interactive. This is a conversation, right? This is a, this is a mutual exchange of ideas. They're explicit, right? So they're ideally, they're said out loud, they're said specifically, and they're written down. They incorporate assessment data. So you might have assessment data that sort of feeds into um, how goals are formulated. Um, but you're definitely going to use assessment data to monitor that progress over time. And ideally, that those, those assessments are going to be pretty low burden. So maybe it's like 10 questions. Um, and they're going to be mutually determined, right? So, so you and the group or you and the particular client are going to... Um, you're going to decide on the most appropriate assessment measures that are helpful for monitoring progress. 
Okay, and the last one is goal setting and goal monitoring incorporate attention to specific mechanisms of behavior change. Client determination, client self-determination, client motivation, and client self-efficacy. Okay, so this is where we see similarities in people's change processes entering the picture in the sense that like the treatment approach is going to explicitly attend to particular processes that you want to kind of build out um, as a way to... Uh, as a, as a way to facilitate the person's change process, which would give them the ideal context. Like, I don't know if I get my That's 8 out of 10. And then in the next slide, you can see uh, the citation. This paper is actually in press at this point. All of these papers are published in the same journal as the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment. So you can um, grab them. There's definitely a lot more information. Now that I'm presenting here. So if you were going to talk to a smart facilitator and talk and, and sort of have a conversation around like the great, you know, ideal practices for engaging in goal setting, right? So I'm talking specifically about goal setting practices. Um, what kind of things might you tell them to do? This could be around like formulating the goal, the approach to the conversation, etc. Like, what is, right, so actually, I mean, we, can, we can't tell clients anything, but we can tell facilitators all sorts of stuff, right? We can, when we're training them, we can tell them what to do. So I'm referring to, like, you know, when we're, tra if we were, you know, mentoring a facilitator or training a facilitator, how might you, um, yeah, so, so definitely. So you would say, so you would say, um, talk to, ask the client. Right? Don't tell the client what the goal is. Ask the client uh, what goal, you know, if they have a goal, um, what it might be. You can also engage in a series of questions around helping them formulate that goal. Uh, you know, it could be around, say, quantity or frequency, um, you know, specific. Uh, what other examples, maybe? Might be things that you would, that you would uh, suggest that they do. Yeah. Yeah, so you're actually asking them to kind of envision the future, get a sense of their values, and then you can sort of back into goals around them, right? So it's more, it's a much less kind of pinning down type of question because it's really like, what do you care about? And um, and then from that, you can, you can back into some, some goals potentially. Other examples? All right, I, we can do the reveal. Okay, so... Um, to do my okay, so there are achievable, specific, and measurable, right? So this is just the forms that goals ideally take. Um, this is the other SMART acronym, right? So this comes out of business or uh, like management, right? So there are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time. You want to specify objectives, right? So ideally, when you're having those goal setting conversations in the groups, you're also talking about specific action steps, right? And you're engaging them in a back and forth around, you know, what they think would help them to get to that, to a particular goal. You want to incorporate others, right? So you're going to actually, you're also potentially going to ask them questions around how others might be able to help them. This could be other smart members. This could be um, their own internal resources. This could be family, friends, health systems. You're going to assess barriers and resources. Right, so this is when that ability comes into the picture. You provide advice, but you're really going to only do it if it's asked for and if, it, if it's really needed, right? So you really can, you know, exhaust the person or the group's resources prior to providing any suggestions around specific goals, specific objectives, uh, definitely like, the, you know, the rationale for a particular goal or objective. Right, so you want to avoid that writing reflex. That avoid to kind of, you avoid that sort of urge to swoop in and name the goal, or I think probably more often for us it might be to help name the objective, right? Because you want to be helpful and you know all the tools, and so it kind of you know it feels like the, you write an appropriate moment to say, well, you know, a lifestyle balance, this particular lifestyle balance exercise may actually be a really good fit here. Um, 
but you can just hold back and wait. I really can guarantee, I, I won't guarantee because I'm a scientist, but um, I would expect and do believe that if you wait, the people will get there. And they're going to come up with the answers, probably the same answers that you had, um, and they might even come up with better answers. You want to help them envision the future, right? So that was your suggestion. So exploring a, a future where the goals are met, potentially exploring a future where the goals are not met, um, this is going to help build those expectancies and those that, that installation. You want to get an explicit commitment and then ideally have like kind of a written plan. So writing it down and then maybe handing it to them or asking them if they want to write it down, things like that. Okay, so these are goal monitoring practices. And we can actually just go ahead and reveal the, the options. Um, so show of hands on this one. How many in this room have set a goal with yourself or with a client and then never followed up on it? <laughs> yeah, okay, so we can identify with this, right? So this, you know, this idea of goal monitoring, I know it does sound like kind of like, you know, pretty structured, um, but I will say that it's, you know, it's coming from a place of, of wanting accountability um, for us. And um, and so these are kind of some tips on how to do that. So we're going to monitor at regular interview, intervals, right? So we're going to have mutually determined what is, what is the group or the client thing that I do in terms of how often we can visit the goal and potentially monitor particular either symptoms or elements of progress over time. It's potentially also going to change over time, right? So maybe monitor every week in the beginning, and then it's every three months, it's every six months, it's every year. Um, you want to carefully select those monitoring measures. So again, these are these are very low burden, right? Like 10 questions. So maybe, and you also need to get a sense of what people care about. Right? Is this, are we going to monitor quality of life? Are we going to monitor depression? Are we going to monitor, you know, number of use days? And so that's definitely like a conversation. At a group level, I can imagine that that would be a really cool conversation to have, to have like the whole group, um, you know, select among uh, uh, different aspects of, of um, progress uh, indicators that they might find important and they might want to kind of keep Check in on again and again over there. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I so um, you want to use, uh, ideally you use like some kind of visual aids. Like people love, we know just from like the success of these self-monitoring apps, like, you know, step counters and things like that. People do like to monitor themselves. They do like to look at, a, you know, like a cool graph. It's like helping them kind of tangibly see what's going on. We want to recognize when treatment is and is not working, right? So there is decent data, at least like for the one-on-one -on -one psychotherapy literature, that suggests that um, people don't always tell their therapists about their progress, even if it's positive or if it's negative, right? Those can be sort of more difficult kind of relational conversations to have, and sometimes people do avoid them. So this provides a more kind of explicit context for that. You can you. You have, a, you have a, a, a regular context for checking in on the relationship and on um, the, the sort of the, the success or the benefit of the, the, you know, basically how therapy is going. These are some tips on um, attending to specific uh, mechanisms of behavior change. So there's things like mutually agreeing upon goals and objectives, treating the client as the expert, uh, because they are. Uh, considering the, the stage of change and really tailoring your approach to that, right? So we're going to be more or less kind of, um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm afraid to use the word directive because I know that that, that is becoming a little dirty in, in this context, but um, you're going to adjust your approach based on where people at, are at in terms of their motivational readiness, right? You want to be particularly gentle when people are in those earlier stages. Related, you're going to honor their ambivalence, okay? Ambivalence is totally, totally normal, and it's really just actually part of the process. And so we want to be, we want to be able to self-regulate around ambivalence, because sometimes to us that looks like resistance or, you know, other things that we're like, oh, um, but this is really, you know, very natural and something that kind of cues us that it might be time to do like a check-in on how things are going. 
Uh, you want to roll with resistance, which is actually like a pretty similar construct. Um, you know, I would say resistance actually just really is potentially just ambivalence. Uh, providing affirmation. So really, you know, and this is both in the head, in the head, in the heart, and in your behaviors, because you really have to be in a particular headspace to see strengths and to have hope. Right? So you need that first and foremost. And then, you know, and then you have the capacity to really genuinely acknowledge those strengths. And you want to reinforce incremental gains. Okay, so this is the last one. Um, this one goes a little bit faster because uh, it, it has a fair amount of repetition with slides that I've already covered. Um, so this is coping skills training. It's defined as a didactic and experiential process for training intra and interpersonal skills with clients or group members. Right? And so some key principles are that this is an action-oriented process. Right? So what we're distinguishing, I'd like to distinguish coping skills training from psychoeducation in the sense that coping skills training really has that applied component. There is some form of application or practice. Uh, where psychoeducation may just be the simple, you know, uh, sharing of, and engaging with information. So skills training is an action-oriented treatment process. It really is, a, you know, like primarily appropriate at certain stages of motivational readiness, meaning more in the action and maintenance phases or the preparation, action, and maintenance phases. Um, it does, again, require a strong working relationship. It also really needs to be grounded in a shared goal. So people, this is you know, engaging in those those new behaviors, those particular coping skills, the, to the certain tools that you might be suggesting in smart meetings, that's the hard work. That's where the rubber hits the road. And so you people really want to be, you really want to make sure that people are signed on to the importance of that work and the rationale for that work. Again, it honors ambivalence, right? So even in the action phases, ambivalence will certainly come up. Um, it incorporates motivation and self-efficacy, so it has that, that attention to key mechanisms of behavior change, and it does have a practice component. So there is an applied component. It's not enough to kind of say, hey, you know, have you considered this? But there is some sort of application that, that, that ideally occurs that, that helps with the learning process. So this slide... It, it, I don't want to. I want to do too much repetition, right? I want you to remember stuff, so I definitely did repeat stuff. But um, this refers to certain slides where there are practices and skills training that overlap with practices that we've already talked about, right? So there are goal setting practices, there are engaging or fostering self efficacy practices, and there are client centered teaching practices. And so those are all summarized on the slide numbers that I provided, um, and you're going to have access to these slides. So these are, this is kind of the new information. And so these are the practices for engaging in practice. And so this is another thing that I, I think will be really interesting in the discussion, because I'm not, I'm kind of wondering how you do that in smart meetings. I'm actually not quite sure. You know, I'm wondering, like, are you doing role plays? I know you have worksheets. Um, you know, you probably make suggestions about, you know, certain behaviors in between sessions. And so um, these are tips around those sort of activities. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I hope we can talk about them in a minute. Uh, again, rationale, right? So we want people to really know why they're doing the things that they're doing. Uh, attention to ambivalence. This is where ambivalence in the action phase will often come up, right? Because we're asking people to do difficult things. We're asking them to take risks. Practice with modeling. So that means that we need to do it, right? We can't be afraid to role play. We have to be willing to talk to an empty chair. Um, we have to potentially provide examples of, you know, how a particular exercise might apply to us. You know, show them that we're willing to take those risks. Practice with consistency and depth. So it really just means that, like, ideally you have enough time to do this. Like, I've got a lot of good information from this from um, Kathy Carroll's Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Manual. And, you know, she says, like, 20 minutes. <laughs> um, so I know that's not always possible, but... The point is that, you know, you do want some, some level of depth. And part of that depth has to do with the opportunity to provide feedback on performance and the opportunity to sort of process and debrief um, the experience, right? And so those are, those are two things that are going to help um, improve sort of repl replication 
of the particular skill and also kind of retention, so bringing in that emotional component, uh, which the debrief can do. Um, there's definitely data that shows that, that it's not quantity of coping skills enacted, it is quality of coping skills. So it is that if you actually like have people do like a practice um, demonstration of particular coping skill, that the quality measure of that performance will produce their outcomes. Okay, so that's it. Um, I have just a couple of discussion points. And I might have violated some of my rules, um, but you should have seen pretty uh, little jargon. You should have seen pretty simple messages. You should have seen decent graphics, including like font size and stuff like that. Uh, you should have seen repetition and some empowerment and interaction. Um, so hopefully you saw me model some of the things that I'm suggesting. And so in the, as far as discussion points, there's really just a couple. Uh, okay, so this model targets providers and training, not just providers, professionals. It's not, it's totally appropriate to anyone at any career stage. But the idea is to just, to develop like really simple good habits um, in relation to things that you already do. Uh, and so, um, oh, okay. so I do want to acknowledge this was a single rater process. That is a limitation from a research perspective. It means that if I had one other person or a whole team of people, we might come up, we might have come up with more principles and practices, different principles and practices, and so on. Um, this is a work in progress, so I want you to, I hope that you stay tuned. And I do want to acknowledge uh, NIAAA for funding this work. This is a, a mid-career independent scientist award that is funding this project, as well as my two, you know, kind mentors who are willing to volunteer their time to help me out with this. Um, and I thank all of you.